wow, Lydia, you're the biggest person on my screen for some reason. Hi, Lydia. <laughs> I never really understand what my Zoom does with who they make big and who they make small. Um, give me a moment, everyone. I'm going to look for something here. Um, okay, good. So is everyone in the room? Dustin, I went ahead and made you co-host. Does everyone, is everyone here, Dustin? I think so. I haven't seen, yeah, I haven't seen. Her. Literally here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I think then that we should all be good. Um, okay, so other than Carissa, we're all good. Okay, great. So um, today, I know I didn't send is that me? Oh, <laughs> um, I didn't send out a, a notification of what our meeting was going to, our class was going to be on today. Um, and actually that's coming out by soon. Dustin and I are almost finished. I have to just tweak a few things and then we'll have the entire schedule for the semester up, including when everybody's performing. Um, I think Dustin, we're going to assign perform performers to days, right? Like we did last semester. Um, but today I thought we could just kind of go over a bunch of topics that are um, talked about in the Virtuosic Flutist book and mainly talking about tone color to start with and the oral cavity. And this is something that we talk about all the time in flute lessons. So I want this to be more of a forum more than anything uh, with questions and things that you've noticed. I mean, you guys are gonna be 60% of this uh, studio class today. Okay, um, so let me share the screen and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, hopefully, or maybe you can share from your experiences, but we are starting on page nine of the Virtuosic Flutist book and we're looking at this diagram that I paid lots of money to Encyclopedia Britannica in order to put into my book and I was like, this is the one thing I want to have be in the book no matter what, because I wanted access to it for teaching and I wanted you all to have access to it because it's it's that profound I think so the first discussion we're going to have today is on tone color so if you have questions about tone color that are already coming to your mind or things that you want me to touch base on go ahead and type them into the comments and Dustin will field them when we have the sort of question comment time and everyone who's present is welcome even if you're not here as a flute studio member you're certainly welcome to ask questions um, and so the first thing is um, how to use this chart, okay? And what I'd like us to do is first look, I'll try to blow these up. We're gonna look at these drawings and I think that they're probably not actually 100% drawings. I think they probably were based off of, partly off of some kind of um, X-ray or some kind of sonogram or something because the positioning of the tongue is really really distinct. So I want to point out very specifically what's what's in each of these because if you don't look carefully enough you'll just think it's generically like what's here and what's here. So the first thing is the blade, the tip of the tongue. Um, if you notice there is a distance between the tip of the tongue and the teeth and there's also a curve here. There's a little dip and that occurs in heed. And if you go to hid, again, you'll notice that the, the shape changes right here. So if you compare this to this, please notice that the tip of the tongue is wider than it is here. It's at a different angle. It's kind of curved and up, upward facing versus this is being kind of like direct that way. And there's a different shape here too. And there's also a different distance between the tip of the tongue and the teeth. Okay, so that's how specific I want you to be centering in on your biofeedback. When we work 
on the tip of the tongue or talk about the oral cavity, which has so much to do with our flute playing tone. It's, it's unbelievable how much it has to do with it. Okay, so that's one area, just noticing these drawings, and I'll zoom out for a second. Um, noticing these drawings and how the tip of the tongue manifests in each vowel section. The next area I want you to be aware of is this peach colored area. So in art, this is called the negative space and this is called the positive space. So the object that is like a more dense or a more foreground object is considered an object that's in the positive space and one that's in the background like wallpaper or the distant landscape is a negative space. So in this rendering, what's in the positive space is mainly the tongue. What's in the negative space is this peach colored area and also this sort of like uh, nose area up here is also a kind of a negative space. So the next thing I want you to notice then is the shape. In fact, if you could kind of squint your eyes a little bit and pretend you're not really looking at a tongue or the inside of your uh, oral cavity and imagine that you're just looking at the shape of this peach color thing. Go ahead and just kind of squint and look. And I want you to actually kind of look at that as if it were just a shape and notice how different each shape is. I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, and if you were successful, your brain might have been kind of like with those books that have those illusions where you can see double and double things and other things come forward and go back. You might have been like, whoa, that really does look like a shape, okay? And this one is the most bizarre one, I think. These are, these are shapes that are actually in your, in your oral cavity when you play and when you say all of these words. Okay, so the shape basically is primarily created by the positioning of your tongue. Because when the tongue is high, then the distance between the tongue and the hard palate, which is this bone here, or even the soft palate, which is back in here, is the distance and how it's shaped is what creates the truly the positive space, which is the shape for your air to move, okay? It's very profound. And if you're thinking about breath, the speed of the air, the velocity of the air, or the volume of the air, the amount of air that's entering into this chamber, into the oral cavity, um, it's all shaped and directed primarily by the tongue. The tongue is also the root of all evil. That's actually a proverb. And it's, it, there's another one. The tongue has no bones, but it can break bones. Have you ever heard that one, anyone? <laughs> I love that one. It's so profound. And it's the same thing with the flute. It can really destroy your flute playing, or it can make your flute playing be amazing. So a biofeedback awareness of what your tongue is doing and what the shape is and what the shape feels like and how the shape resonates and creates the resonance of the movement of the air is really key to excellent flute playing. Okay, so we have the position of the tongue, its distance, the shape that it creates from the hard palate to the tongue. And notice that they're kind of like three positions. So you have the front part of the tongue, then you have the middle part of the tongue, and then you have the back of the tongue. Okay, if you look at this um, image here, you'll see that the front-ish part of the tongue dips and therefore there's this space. The middle part of the tongue is kind of flattened, but it's raised and therefore it's flat and there's this space here. And the back of the tongue is up and aimed kind of back. And so that is creating um, a channel for the air to come up and hit the soft palate, which is right here, spin this way, come into a little bit of an opening, and then be expelled through what you do here with your embouchure and your aperture. And this hood, if you say hood for a moment, go ahead and say hood. I want you to imagine if you had water in your mouth on your tongue, would it stay there? Just take a moment and say hood. Because there's a shape in here that you can't see in the picture. 
Cool. Raise your hand if you feel um, like a scoop, like you could actually keep water in your tongue if you did that. Great, and it's a thing to try, okay? So the way to do it is to put water in your mouth and keep it underneath your tongue. So you just have a little bit of water in your mouth. And then you're gonna bring your tongue in, you're gonna scoop the water up and you're gonna, ooh. And then you can kind of release the water, it goes back down there. And you can try all these different positions. And in a position where your tongue can't pull the water, it will just be underneath your tongue in that um, basin. How do I know that? Because I've tried it. Did anyone teach that to me? No. <laughs> it's a strange thing, but it's actually quite fun. So give it a whirl today at some point. Um, it's, it's really fascinating. And when we talk about a sound having a roundness to it or a core or even like, sometimes you'll hear me use the, like a term like nuttiness, like there's a nut in your mouth, like a hazelnut or a gobstopper, like some kind of round candy. It's usually this kind of oud position because if you have a candy in your mouth, imagine that for a second, like a big round gumball, okay? Where will it be? It would most likely be scooped and held in your tongue. It's highly unlikely that you're gonna store your gumball gobstopper thing. Hold on for a second. It's unlikely that you're gonna store your gumball gobstopper thing back here where you're gonna end up choking. So most likely you'll have it in the scoop. Okay. Now the other area I want you to look at is the pharynx. So that is the when you open your mouth and, and, and say, ah, and you look in the mirror and you see the back of your throat, the skin that's back there, that's this area. And this is called the pharynx. And it actually has three, locate, three uh, like uh, micro sections, okay? So the three micro sections are the laryngopharynx, which is the area of that back of the throat People call it the throat, but it's really not officially called the throat from a scientific perspective. The laryngopharynx is the area that's below and kind of near the larynx. And then there's the oropharynx. So that's the area that you see when you look in the mirror and you open your mouth. You can imagine if this person's mouth were open and their tongue were dropped or depressed and you look straight back. And you wouldn't see this, by the way, this is not this is not anatomically correct, this would be lifted, you would see this, the back of that. And then the nasopharynx is the area that's above the soft palate. So if you go like, if you go kind of like, you can even try it like you're, pretend you're in sixth grade and you're like, there's no way I'm gonna do that. And you blow air out and you make that funny sixth grade kind of thing with a little bit of attitude, you'll end up with this vibrating and that's the nasopharynx. So when you catch a cold and you can't breathe through your nose, it's because this is stopped up, okay? Because this is the passageway that connects to filling your air with lungs. And so when this is stopped up, the nasopharynx, you don't have access to it. Um, I'm gonna pause for some questions and then we'll keep moving on. So you can either do the little hand icon thing or Dustin, are there any questions? Or you can raise your hand. Okay, so no questions so far? No, okay. I did post in the chat um, something that reminds me of this. Uh, that's kind of a resource that has to do with this. So okay. I, I can include that in the weekly updates as well. Oh, thank you. That's excellent. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so like when you have a cold or like, um, I guess your throat is sore, like what part of your throat is that? And then does that affect how you play at all? I don't know. I guess I've like never played flute when I was sick, but. Yeah, okay. So, and if you do, by the way, you should definitely clean out your instrument. And also, by the way, on a slight tangent, 
make sure that you guys are washing your, your cloths, your cleaning cloths as well, okay? Um, it's easy to forget. You just kind of throw the cloth in and you're not washing it out, but um, you know, pop those in the washing machine often or not even just wash them out um, in your sink and let it dry overnight. Um, but to answer your question, Katie, um, the part of the throat that typically is sore, I would say, are you thinking about this right here when this feels sore? Yeah. Okay. So that is like the back of, I guess, I guess that would be the oral pharynx. I don't know. Yeah. Usually what happens um, is if you have some kind of sinusitis, so any kind of like um, infection up in here, it drains. And then it causes um, soreness in the back, which you can see sometimes it's red back in this area in the oropharynx. But also down by where these, um, the esophagus is, is where you feel that hurt, tightening hurtness, hurtiness of like the sore throat. Um, sometimes you'll feel like if you've ever had uh, sw swollen, um, like if you've ever had strep throat, God forbid, that is the most painful thing. But those are all the glands that are located kind of to the right and left of, of like the soft palate, sort of behind the soft palate. So when you have pain kind of like up and high, it's the glands that are right up in here behind the soft palate. Juan, you had a question? Yeah, uh, mine is kind of related to um, like uh, flutter tonguing with that part, with that back part of the nasopharynx as you described it. Yeah. Um, I usually use my tongue, but when I do use my throat, is there some way to optimize that? Because I always find that it leaves me feeling like, like as if I have a sore throat when I'm using the back of my, of my throat for, for flutter tonguing. Yeah, okay, that's such a great question. I'm glad you brought up flutter tonguing. So first, let's clarify what Juan is talking about. So um, some people, and Juan, you should be able to because you speak Spanish. Right. You can flutter the front of your tongue, can't you? So there's like, um, this is a little bit random fun information. There's a window of time in the um, development of the human where they can almost learn any kind of language. And then that window shuts. And when I say language, I don't mean like vocabulary and grammar. I mean the ability to like really absorb and learn a language and actually get the sounds down. So that's why it's hard, for example, if you're older than the age of seven to learn Chinese, you know, Mandarin or something, something that is really fine tuned with pitches. But if you've been around that language a lot or other languages or the sounds of different languages, and some use like a lot of h, h, a lot of what they call guttural sounds. Um, you know, in Spanish, there's a lot of front tongue, trrr, a lot of the rolling of the tongue. If you're around that a lot, when you're under the age of, I think it's four, then um, the body picks up like sort of an intuitive way of making those sounds. So that's just kind of some random information. Um, but what Juan's talking about is some people can't roll the front of their tongues, or maybe they can, um, but they choose to do what's called uvicular flutter tonguing. So this, this thing that hangs down, and again, this is a really poor picture of it, um, but if you think of a cartoon um, with a character screaming and that little, thing that hangs down, that's called the uvula. You know, when they scream and, it, ah, and it's like wiggling. <laughs> I'm always like, wow. So they're kind of flutter tonguing. Actually, it doesn't really shake like that when you scream in real life. You can try it and look. But um, basically when you flutter tongue what's happening, but when you use uvicular flutter tongue, uvicular flutter tonguing, it's uvicular fluttering, um, is that you're shaking the uvula. And so the soft palate, which is the u, which is connected to the uvula, the soft part of your um, skin. In fact, let's find it. Take your tongue and go like this. If you do that, your tongue is up against your hard palate. So try it again. Kind of like if you're imitating a horse ride. But if you take the back of your tongue and you say honk, like H-O-N-K, and you hang out on the end part, honk, honk, and you hang out before you say the K, your, the back of your tongue is up against your soft palate. So, so say that and hold the N out, honk, 
And now go ng, 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 ng. Take the back of your tongue where it's hanging out on that end and just kind of ng, 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 up and down. You can make some, make some rhythms if you want. Um, that's the soft palate. And so what that looks like here is, so here's a bone. That's the hard palate. And the soft, and it moves into a thin layer of like skin and tissue. That's the soft palate. Oh, look, 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 up in there. And then the uvula hangs down. It's a little shaky thing. And so when you go to create uvicular fluttering, uh, first of all, the reason it sounds like flutter tonguing sort of is because the airstream is coming up and it's being disrupted by something that's moving fast. Okay, so when you're flutter tonguing, if you can do it, go ahead and say and get your little like your, your tongue moving. The tongue is creating disturbance in the airstream and the flute is picking up that disturbance and that's how you have flutter tonguing. The same thing happens with the uvula. If you, if you create, um, if you navigate the air so that it passes its way up and creates momentum and velocity behind that area of the soft palate, then you can get that to shake. And that's the thing, okay? And a great way to te teach this, this is a little pedagogical thing, but when you're teaching it to younger kids, and a great way to make them laugh is just to be like, are you serious? And when you do that, they can all relate because they've seen it on Nickelodeon or something, even if they personally don't behave that way. They can all go, so just try that for a moment and just be like, get in touch with your inner third grader and be like, do that a few times and notice how the air is kind of going up. I can feel it vibrating in here. That is how you actually activate the motion of the uvula with fast air and it's all created by not moving the uvula. You're not making it go like this. You're channeling the air with a certain amount of breath pressure and velocity to travel up and in to this section instead of up and over to that section. Eventually it travels in, it flutters and it, it makes its way over. Juan, I feel like there's another, like a C part to your question. Was there another part I didn't answer? Yeah, um, referring to how, how you can optimize it so that one, it doesn't sound bad and two, it doesn't, like it always kind of feels like it hurts my throat. Okay, well, first of all, I want you all to be way more clear and not use vague words like throat. So can you be more clear? Because now you can see there are many things in what people call the throat. What hurts, Juan? And how does it hurt? Is it actual pain or is it fatigue? Or what, can you be more, uh, can you kind of tap into your biofeedback and help us understand? I think it would be more in the esophagus and laryngopharynx area. Um, oh, whoa. whoa. <laughs> and it feels more like that sensation when you have a sore throat where it's like, it feels kind of raspy and like, uh, uh, like, I don't know, like irritated rather okay. than pain. Yep. So most likely what's happening, and let me see if I can pull up a, a picture on Google of the, um, Glottis. Uh, most likely what's happening there, Juan, is that you're, you're tensing up the glottis. Okay, the glottis is the area, the region um, between the vocal folds. Um, and that's what people talk about when they say, I feel like I have a, a sore throat. Okay, so here are your, here's your Here's your, here are your vocal folds and here's the areas of the glottis, okay? So I would say that most likely what's happening, and this is not related to your uvula or your soft palate. You can see from this picture, 
that the glottis is like way down here and the uvula is way up here. Do you see that? So I think it's a matter of isolation, Juan, and that you're, um, you're not body mapping correctly. That you're, you're kind of giving yourself mixed messages and you're thinking that in order to get this to vibrate, you have to tighten this. Um, the only thing that where that could be um, related in a healthy way would be is if you're you bring you're bringing the folds together more so that you have less air escaping through this area um, which is a technique it's a filter you can see from like these other pictures that in fact you can try it if you guys make a wheezing sound like he 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 and you sort of bring your vocal folds together and try to inhale your your folds are not open. And that's why they're making that vibrating sound. Okay. And so, whoops, I don't know what I just did, but um, trying to do this, I can't. Okay. Um, anyway, so I think Juan, your pain, quote unquote pain, is coming from tension in the glottis that's not necessary. And um, not able to navigate out of this for a second. I'll see if I can get like a better view here. Um, this is a literal glottis, probably taken with one of those scopes that they put down. But this looks like an actual glottis. You can see the vocal folds and the space. So you can tighten this, and this is the epiglottis. This is the thing that shuts um, down when you swallow food because the food enters through the mouth into the oral cavity right here. You, you chew it, it comes down, and then either it's gonna wanna go into your lungs or it's gonna wanna go into your belly. And so this flap, the epiglottis, the chewing reflex causes the uh, passageway to your lungs to shut down and so that the food transitions into your belly. But this is probably what you're feeling is some tension there, Juan. Now, your question was how do you um, make it like better, right? How do you increase the, um, the, the sound of the uvicular flutter tonguing? Was that it? How do you optimize it? Correct? Yeah. OK, so the answer to that is you want to really um, think about your velocity of your air the speed of your air, and you want to navigate it so that the air travels up higher. And not only higher, but normally when you play the flute, this is shut. Did you guys know that? How many people know that typically your, your soft palate and your uvula are raised and shut when you play the flute? Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay, it's something that a lot of people don't know. In singing, it's also shut. If you don't, you get ha, ha. Try that, just feel the air moving through your nose as it moves to your mouth. Ha, ha. You can feel that the soft palate is lower. Now go ha, do that a few times. Ha, you can feel that the soft palate is raised. Ha, and therefore you're getting a clearer sound. Try both of them. Ah, ah. Pretty fascinating. Same exact vocal folds vibrating, same exact breath, same exact breath pressure. The only thing I change is I drop the um, soft palate in one example and I raised it in the other. So sometimes you'll run into a situation where you have a student or you yourself maybe getting a certain kind of flute sound out and you're like, I have no idea what's going on here. It may be that their soft palate is not raised and that part of the air is exiting through their nose. And in fact, that is a technique of playing that Peter Lloyd uh, worked with me on specifically for something uh, in a way of re uh, releasing the air where you articulate and you release some of it through your nose and some through your mouth. Ethan, I think we talked about that last year, right? Yeah, okay. So, Quan, um, the soft palate is dropped and therefore the air goes behind it and it vibrates and you have fast air motion. 
and that's what sets up the vibration. And then another way to optimize the sound is to make sure that your your the is the final escape of the air is really good and clear. Okay, so I'm going to pause again for some more questions if there are any. We got on a nice little tangent there about flutter tonguing. Okay, I don't see any. If I missed it, feel free to unmute yourselves and speak up. So what I want to try next is, and I and I want to talk about how to use this when you practice. Um, is I want us to say these words, looking at the picture, and as we say the words um, or breathe them out, I'll I'll uh, describe it as we go. I want you to try and see if you can start to create a really good biofeedback into the different aspects of the picture. So if you see me do this while we're on a vowel, if you see me do this, I want you to be like zoning in. You might even have to close your eyes. Zoning in on what part, what that part of your oral cavity feels like and the position of your tongue. If you see me do this, I want you to do the same thing there. And then again, back to the um, oropharynx, I want you to notice maybe the space and what you think the shape is as you're on a certain vowel. So we're gonna move through these vowels and you have two options. You can either say like heed and vibrate your vocal folds and create the sound, or you can simply say heed, but breathe it out so that you hear the sound that way. Okay, those are your two options. And you can oscillate between the two. Actually, the breathing one is, is really helpful because you don't really need to um, set your vocal folds in motion to get the full benefit of this. When we play the flute, what we're really doing is and not e. we're not actually vocalizing unless you're singing and playing. Which by the way, Sammy, I think we talked about this this week. Maybe it was you. What is the most optimal vowel for singing and playing? Was it us, Sammy? It wasn't, but he... Oh, it was... E? Is it E? It's ooh. Ah, oh, dang. Yeah, but what's the difference between E and ooh? Um, mostly just the front placement of your lips. Ta-da! Oh, so that makes sense why ooh works better. Yeah, okay. because E, the, the tongue is up, E, everyone say E. E, and notice that like, and, and this is part of the biofeedback piece of it, notice that the back sides of the tongue, like this part of it right here, and again, these are not in the pictures. The teeth are not in, the, in these pictures, but the back sides of the tongue are kind of anchored and touching your molars. E, hang out there for a second. How thick is your tongue between your top and your bottom teeth? E, like if you bit, would you bite your tongue? E, how much of your tongue would you bite if you bit down? E, and now say e, and bring your lips forward and try not to move your tongue. E, and suddenly you have the oo vowel. So I think it's the most optimal vowel for singing and playing for several reasons. One is it sets up the velocity of the air really nicely. It's not really open and woofy. And then you've got a little bit of a reed, like an ovo reed. You have a little bit of the direction of the air, which you can then, uh, which is so disturbed because you've got these, the vocal folds, um, the vibration of the cords disturbing the uh, column of air. And so it's disturbing the column of air, it's coming up, it's going through, and all of this, um, oscillation is happening and then you have one final say you get one final way of making the sound sound good and directing the air into the instrument or out to catch the flute so that you can sing and play which was really sing and sound the instrument and that is done by navigating the angle of the airstream with the position of the lips okay I'm pausing again for questions or thoughts. Okay, I don't see any. So let's go. Oh, yep, Ethan, go ahead. Um, so, you know, like um, throat singing, like how if, um, I'm not sure which culture does it, but if you go like, ew, ew, like there's like overtones. Yeah. 
Um, why does that happen? Um, I think it's related to something called formants. Um, and I think that they don't really know what formants are. Um, but formants, and I'm not a pro on this, formants are, is a word given to some kind of a physics phenomenon, a sound physics phenomenon that occurs in the oral cavity when somebody sings. So it's kind of like if you can imagine sound waves, how if you were making a recording and you were watching the waves go up and down, there is a way for them to note the formants in the mouth, uh, in the oral cavity. And so what happens is when you go, and in fact, you may have even done this just now when you went from E to U, you may have noticed an overtone series between your lips. Did anyone notice that? That's great, like four or five of us, it's kind of cool. We'll try it again in a second. But I think what's happening is if you think about a multiphonic, in a multiphonic, you're splitting the dynamic, um, the energetic aspects of the sound. So you've got like the velocity of the air, you've got the, um, the most optimal setup for the partials in a sound. Um, and that's why you can get like sort of two notes coming out if your setup is correct and your velocity is correct and then your air is angled correctly. Um, when you go E, you've got something going on in there and then you bring the lips forward. E, right in the middle of there, there's like a little sound and it's a combination of the formants, I believe, um, maybe even some formants in the lips and then the vibration. Let's try it once more just for fun, just to see if more, more of you can hear that happen. So you're gonna go from E to U and somewhere between the transfer, you can go in and out, back and forth. You're gonna hear like almost like a whistling that happens between your teeth and your lips and it's, a, it's a, like a third pitch. I want to know what Ethan and Juan are laughing about. <laughs> we were singing on the same pitch. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, so that's that. I love these tangents. Please keep asking these tangential questions. They're so fun. Okay, so we're gonna do this game now, right? This is a game, I guess we're calling it a game. We're going to uh, try all of these vowels out and you're going to be getting in that space and trying to, create a, trying to create biofeedback. Okay, you're gonna think about the width of your tongue, the scoop of your tongue. You're gonna think about your teeth. Where does the tongue lie in the mouth? How close is it to the hard palate? Where does it, how does it feel back here? And I'm gonna be kind of coaching you through that by suggesting things to think about. And you're gonna be developing your own biofeedback. So let's start with heed. Just take a breath, do it a million times, as many times as you want. Okay, direct your attention to the front area between the tip of the tongue and the teeth, top and bottom. I want you to think about the width of the tongue. If we were looking at it from straight ahead, how wide would it be? And now I want you to direct your attention to your teeth, your bottom molars, and how the tongue feels up against them. How far back does it go all the way to your wisdom teeth? Is there any pressure? Like, do you feel most of the pressure of the tongue pushing against the teeth here or here or here? Mm -hmm. And how does this feel? You can go for it, Krista. Don't worry about being too loud. It's fine. How does this feel? Do you feel this vibrating? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you're going to do that, and I'm going to have you move from he to ha. And I want you to keep your concentration on the sense of vibration right here, like this. And try and see if you can, up in here in your, in your nasal cavity, uh, feel some of the vibration, how it shifts between the two vowels. So go ahead and try a few times.
And as you're doing ia ia, bring your attention to your molars again and to the tongue's connection to your molar. Does it feel like it go, goes away and comes back? Does it pressurize against the molar? Does it not pressurize? Good, take a break. What did some people notice? Nathan. So I noticed um, that I f when I was doing the E sound, I felt it more in like my head, especially like my sinuses and my teeth. And when I moved down to the ah, I felt it more like in my chest and throat. Okay, beautiful. Is that something you've ever noticed before? Or was that like a new biofeedback for you? It, it's something that I've like vaguely noticed, but not like thought so much with um, which syllable it was. I just have noticed that sometimes I feel things more up here and others more down here. Excellent. So it's another thing to try, like the water in the bottom of your mouth. Okay. Um, and um, the other thing I was going to say about that is um, that you can actually, and we've all done this in lessons. In fact, Chris and I even did it in a lesson today. When I talk about like sending the sound through your eyes or through this part of your nose and making a point and sending the sound this way, that um, suggestion often intuitively triggers for us to raise our tongues because somehow we just sort of think, well, if I have to make it buzz here, I need to do something. And it's related to what you just said, uh, Nathan. It's like you, you know that sensation, but you don't know how you're making it, okay? And today's class is about, well, how do we make it? And the answer is you raise your tongue. If you're gonna raise the back of your tongue and, and you use an e-vowel, you will feel all of this vibration in here. And when you're asking yourself to create a more buzzy flute sound, an edgier sound, or if I'm asking you to send the sound through this part, basically, physiologically, what you're doing is raising the back of your tongue. Juan. Um, this might not be related, but how does, um, you know those tubes in your ears that make your ears pop? How does that factor in? Because when I was doing the exercise, I found that like that popping sensation would happen sometimes. Okay, well, what that makes me think is that when you did your ah, you really dropped your jaw. Like you're, you, everyone just take a second and go, pretend you're yawning, it might make you yawn, and see if you can hear that clicking like in your ear or sensation. Raise your hand if you feel something clicking or, sen or sensation in your ear. Okay, first of all, to answer your question, Juan, that's, those are called the eustachian tubes. And they're, um, oh, good, I can try to look these up too. Let's see if I know how to spell the word. It's like, ah, it's very, uh, it's very Latin. It's like e u. I think it's with an, a C. Great, here we go. So these are, this is your ear canal. So when you use Q-tips, this is where your Q-tip goes. And then you've got your eardrum and you've got all this incredible mechanism. We're just so beautifully made. Look at all of this is incredible that we have this. And then there's this little tube right here. And then this attaches into your mouth up in here. So Juan, when you were going, e in fact, do it and overdo it, everybody. e you can kind of hear something or feel something open. That's the eustachian tube. When you yawn, go for it. It feels so good at 346 on a Thursday to yawn. When you yawn, can you feel this opening? Raise your hand if you feel it opening and something spreading. Okay, how many of you have ever gone up in an airplane or underwater deep enough that you felt 
pressure and you had to kind of blow your nose or yawn. Okay, that's called equalizing. This tube collects pressure and if it's not dealt with, it can create um, enormous amount of pain in this part and it could potentially uh, pop your eardrum. Okay, so it's important for scuba divers and it's important for you as people who go maybe in airplanes or rockets to the moon, wherever you're going, um, that you learn to equalize. And that's what happens is if you take your fingers and you close your nose and you blow as if you're blowing out, it sends, pre it depressurizes and sends the pressure back and equalizes the pressure. Did I answer your question, Juan? Or part of it? Okay, super. I love these questions, thank you. Okay, so let's go back to this. Now I'd like to try hid head. So we're gonna go hid, you don't have to, you don't have to restate the H or the D. You can just go hid, yeah, like you're saying hid and head. And let's start with hid, just hid or with an exhale. Go for it, here's the picture. I'd like you to notice how the tongue kind of comes up. See if you can feel that in your mouth. Now, for a second, go between heed and hid and see how the spread of the tongue feels different against your molars and the shape of it. Heed, hid, heed, hid. What changes is what you want to ask yourself. And now let's go further and do he, 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 he. Okay, keep doing that. Noticing on he, the distance from here to here, and he, the space. And now let's go back into vibration for a moment. He, back and forth, noticing how it changes, the way your heart palate feels. He, try to do it just with your tongue and not your jaw. Try not to go he, he, just your tongue lifting and depressing. And now let's move from head to had, okay? So again, look at this arc and look at how the tongue then kind of comes back but flattens over the top. Head, had, head, had. See if you can feel this, head, had, how it kind of comes back. Okay, let's just do two more. I'd like to go from heed to hood because it's quite extreme. And I want you to notice that little water slash gumball location in the scoop of the tongue and see if you can kind of identify with your tongue being in this bizarre looking shape. Going from heed to hood. Do you feel something back in here is the question. Go ahead and try that a few times. How does the scoopy part of the tongue and hood feel different when you're in heed mode? Does it feel more splayed out, more flattened in the front? And when you move to hood, how far back does the scoop go? Does it feel like the entire side of your tongue is up while the inside is dipped? Okay, I'm going to pause for things that you may have noticed or questions, and then we're going to um, talk briefly about how this, how to use this uh, when you're working on tone color. So anything that you notice that you think would be neat to share? Okay, Nathan? So this one's probably kind of weird, but I noticed every time that I would change from, uh, so in the order that they're written from one of the syllables to like the next one, I would almost instinctively drop the tone by a half step. And I'm not sure if there's like a specific reasoning for that or if that's just me being weird. So you were like going he, 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 ha, ho, ho. Yeah, basically. Okay, I think I know what that is actually. This is a hypothesis. 
I think, you know how we have an issue sometimes where as we're playing and the, the notes are descending, we tend to dip our chin. I think the same thing's happening there for you, Nathan. I think that as you feel your tongue coming down, you are instinctively lowering your pitch because something about the downness of it and the fact that you're making a sound makes you want to down the sound also. What do you think? Is that a good guess? <laughs> Sounds pretty reasonable to me. I think it makes sense. Who knows? Katie, did you have a comment? Oh, I did. I don't know if I raised my hand or not, but I noticed that like my lower jaw was moving with a different sound. So it wasn't just like the inside of my mouth. And I don't know if my jaw should be staying stable or if it should be moving. Um, well, it's going to move depending on like where you're going. So basically the, first of all, there is no upper and lower jaw. Okay. Just let's get all that straight officially so that we're all speaking correctly about this. There's only one jaw, um, but there is a, a tendency for people to talk about the jaw as if there were two bones and as if they both moved, okay? But just to get our body mapping organized, there's one jaw and it hinges here and it moves up and down. So now go E, ah, and over-exaggerate the ah. E, ah, and put your fingers right here on your mandible. Um, you've heard of TMJ, the M in TMJ stands for mandible. And you're going to notice like all those muscles, he, ha, you'll feel like they, they start to like become dynamically engaged. He, ha, e, -a. Okay. Now pretend you're chewing on something and bite down. Keep your, keep your fingers there and chew. Keep chewing, chew, release, chew, release. So you can even see my hands moving out. Those are the muscles of the jaw. So to respond to you, Katie, in some instances, in order to get more space in your mouth to create the vowel that you're about to create or to move the tongue into a position, your jaw will descend. Um, but it, like in the case of Juan in the beginning, Juan was over, I think you were overdoing it, Juan. I think you were going from he to ha and you felt your eustachian tubes uh, being affected. Okay, so let's close by in the last five minutes or so talking about how to use this exercise. So what I'd like you to do when you open up to this page in the book, which I hope you're all actively, you know, at least every other week, you should be flipping the topics that you're working through, whether it's vibrato or um, tone color, breathing. There's so many great exercises. Keep reading the front chapters because um, probably the best thing that you can get out of what is in them is, is a proper way to teach and explain and express all of the attributes of these elements, okay? I, I took a long time writing that and really trying to craft it carefully. And I spoke with singers and I did a lot of research. So it's, it's really kind of very clear. Um, but when we think about color and you're working on color, what I want you to do first is look at that picture, say the word, and then I want you to play, play it on the flute. So you would go, he, he, ha, for example, saying it, then you hold your flute up and you're gonna blow across and you're going to, in your oral cavity, make the adjustments so that you're saying, he, he, and then you're gonna listen and you're gonna be like, wow, that hardly changed my sound because every one of these vowels is so incremental, like Nathan was saying, it's almost like a microtone if you were to add pitches to it. So every, every positioning of the tongue is only minute, but then I want you to try the extreme versions. I want you to go from E to all in the flute, saying it first, looking at the pictures, and then e ah e ah e ah and trying to isolate the tongue mostly. Notice what the lips need to do to keep the sound good, and that most of the movement occurs in the oral cavity, primarily with the with the tongue, as we've seen. Then you'll move over to tone color, and um, this exercise then literally will explains that you could try e a a u or any other vowel that you want. And I wanna point out to some pitfalls and then I'll stop for final questions. 
And that is that most of us have a tendency when we rise, and this is again related to what Nathan was saying, and when we descend to actually change the vowel. And you might not even notice you're doing it because it sounds so normal to you that there is no indication that something's going on unless you're super in touch with the biofeedback of what is literally happening in your, in your oral cavity. So I want to have you be extra mindful that when you're going up and coming down, that you're keeping the color the same, number one, and then try not changing anything on the inside. What you will find is that if you don't change anything on the inside or in your lips, it's highly probable that your actual tone color may not remain consistent. It's like the opposite. And so in order to, to keep the tone color consistent, you might need to make some adjustments. But you can also challenge yourself by just saying, I don't care about what comes out. My focus is on the biofeedback of keeping my tongue in one position. Okay, so those are different ways of using this. And then there are these exercises where you can do crescendo, decrescendo. Now that's really tricky because a lot of times we open to crescendo and we close to decrescendo. So you have to be aware of whether you're doing that and again, what's happening with the tongue. Okay, and then there are these like really fast uh, passages where you try to keep everything stable. You're just moving your fingers and again, noticing. So I'm gonna pause because I hope there are some final thoughts or questions. So I see Ethan maybe with a hand up. Is that right, Ethan? Anyone else? Okay, Ethan. Um, so with the dynamic exercise on that page, I've always had trouble getting loud with the ooh vowel. Great. I, um, I was hoping somebody would say that, or then I was kind of hoping it wouldn't come up because it's a huge topic. But I'll be, br I'll be brief. So basically within each palette range, you really only have a limit of loudness and softness. Okay, and the other thing is, so basically to really master tone color and to master dynamics, you really need to have a clear understanding of which positions will yield what level of loudness because some of them like you're noticing with ooh will not yield say past a six. So, and that's hard to like accept <laughs> because let's say you want to play in ooh because it's smoky and it's French and you want to create this beautiful sound and you want it to be loud and you're limited. So then your option is to simply switch the tone color. You add a little red to it, just like when you're mixing colors. So if ooh is like a smoky blue and you want it to intensify, you slightly bring the tongue up, you're slightly modifying the vowel and suddenly you've got lavender or purple. Um, but basically, yes, each tone color, if you're remaining consistent here, is gonna have its limit. And you guys need to know exactly where that is to really master, um, to master your ability as artists. Another question? Okay, I'm glad we were all able to meet on this and every once in a while, we're gonna have more like these this semester where we're just kind of going through the main topics of not just the book, but just like topics of the flute. And again, pretty soon the entire schedule for the semester will be out. Once it's out, we'll put it on uh, Facebook, Instagram. It's free for people to come in and watch so you can share it with your musician friends. Um, most of what we talk about is not only related to the flute. Um, and I guess that's it. And soon the master schedule for the semester will be coming out too for lessons, like exactly, um, you know, when we are meeting, when online, when not. And, um, you know, there, we have a number of odd days off this semester, like there's a Wednesday and a Thursday off. And so that'll be out hopefully by Sunday. And also for the grad students, how many lessons and with whom you'd be taking lessons for your extra lessons. Okay, thank you all for listening and I hope it was helpful. And if you have more questions, you can just email me or we can talk in lessons, okay? Bye. Katie, I'm upstairs.